Though Queen's College was founded in 1341 by Robert de Egglesfield, chaplain to Philippa of Hainault, the wife of Edward III, it is perhaps best known today for its great 17th and 18th century classical buildings, like the hall, the chapel, and the library. In 1691, Bishop Thomas Barlow, former provost of Queen's, bequeathed to the college his books. It was such a generous bequest that the college had to build a new library to house them. And what was built is perhaps the finest classical building in Oxford, now more apparent than ever thanks to a major refurbishment only just completed. But the library is important not only in its own right, but also because it seems to have been the catalyst to put into operation a plan that had been discussed for over 20 years. And that plan was to rebuild the college in its entirety. Now, this was not unprecedented. Both University College and Oriel had done this earlier in the century, but Queen's was to be far more ambitious. Nowhere is this more evident than in the chapel. Oxford College chapels had a pattern. They were rectangles, and when there was sufficient space, an anti-chapel was built across it to form a T-shape. But at Queen's, where there was plenty of space, the anti-chapel is simply a lobby to the main chapel. And though the chapel begins at the rectangle, it ends beyond the sanctuary gates in a semicircular apse, a form more reminiscent of a classical Roman temple than of the typical English Gothic church. Oxford had nothing like it. To many of us today, the idea of Rome conjures up images of orgies and feasts with slaves peeling grapes for emperors. And this is an image that in many ways derives from the 18th century with Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. But as his title suggests, Rome had something to decline from. And it is the virtues that they saw in the Roman Republic that the fellows of Queens wanted to emulate. The men of 18th century Oxford were certainly not Republicans. They were deeply embarrassed by their great-grandfather's execution of Charles I, and they would be horrified when the French executed their king later in the century. But they were very proud of the so-called Glorious Revolution, in which their grandfathers had driven James II from the country, just as the Roman citizens had done when their king had turned tyrant. And importantly, classical architecture was also an academic and theoretical subject in a way that Gothic architecture never had been. The works of the Roman architect Vitruvius were known and discussed throughout Oxford. And although Wren and Hawksmoor, both of whom submitted designs for parts of the college but not as actually built, must have had a hand in the designs, so did several senior members of the university. The truth is that the final designs were probably the composite of ideas from many different people, most of whom we would now consider today to be amateurs. 18th century Oxford is often regarded as dull, sleepy and intellectually impoverished. And in a formal sense, this is true, for the curriculum was still essentially medieval. But informally and unofficially, the fellows of the colleges researched and discussed a whole range of subjects as diverse as natural science and history, and including, of course, the interest in architecture which made these buildings possible. It is these hidden, unofficial seeds of modern academia that these buildings represent. It is a pity that we no longer have the medieval buildings of Queen's, but it is important that Oxford has one great, complete, classical college.